Welcome back to IndyK 2015. I'm here with Adam and we're talking about Overland. Uh, survival, choices, blocks, uh, tell us about the game. Yeah, so uh, Overland was originally inspired by um, a tweet. A tweet? Uh, which is always a good source of inspiration for like a two year long project in which you invest like your whole life in business and everything. Um, but the, I, uh, I was sort of, I was playing a lot of strategy games at the time, uh -huh. so I was playing a lot of um, 868 Hack by Michael Bro, which is this really elegant, um, really minimalist uh, sort of strategy survival roguelike sort of a thing uh, uh, on iPad at the time. And I was also playing a lot of the XCOM reboot yes. by Jake Solomon and Fraxis, which is just um, a really marvelous game. And um, I thought, oh, it'd be cool to take some of this squad-based uh, uh, sort of I care about this guy, I don't want this guy to, to die, and the options that I have are based on all these different people, but kind of smoosh it down into that smaller, like, uh, smaller grid space, which is also, in a lot of ways, like a smaller decision space, um, to where I think, if you play XCOM on a hard enough setting, at a high enough level, choices like, should I hide behind this bush or this bush, are life or death choices. Right. Um, but I wanted to kind of get that kind of smooshed down to a place where um, lots of other people can have that experience because I think that's a really powerful thing to sit there and play a game and not just be like swipe in on the thing and like I mean we make mobile games and like right. I understand like the role that just swiping on a thing serves for people but getting people to this place where they can be like I don't know if I should swipe left or right I actually need to think about the short and the long term consequences of this one small move. Um, and make that every decision in the game. Uh, just to uh, just to sort of like roll back, what is like going into the story of the game? Oh, what, absolutely. Like, yeah. Let's let's go in like right. you, like we. I'm I really want to talk about meaningful decisions. I yeah, really yeah, want to yeah. talk about like this world that you're building. Let's just talk about like the story. Like where where are we doing? Where are we going? What what is this what is this place? Yeah, absolutely. So it's sort of like uh, Oregon Trail in the post apocalypse. Yes. So you are uh, sort of on a road trip from the east coast of the United States to the west coast. Um, something horrible has happened. It's not a zombie apocalypse, it's not an alien invasion, um, but nothing is the same and it never will be again. Of There's course. no uh, you're not on a mission to save the world. You're just sort of um, on this trip, and it, it just so happens that there's nothing really left. And so um, uh, you kind of meet different randomly generated characters and get into uh, every, every level or scenario you go to is randomly generated, and then the overhead kind of strategic roadmap where you decide where should I go next and why, that's also randomly generated. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Like, I really love, like, sort of the setting, the placement for each of the the areas that you're visiting has this sort of like, it's almost like a piece of the world has been like cut out, sort of transported, and you have this, you do have like, like you said, like the XCOM sort of like, you have like the different places that you can go mm -hmm. to, you have, you have the, the decisions. Like what, what made you think about like, sort of like building this world in the way and setting it up in sort of like the, the environments that you have? Uh, this is driven by a few different things. Um, one is um, our, our director, Heather Penn, who's best, based here in LA, uh, is just amazing. Um, and uh, pretty soon after we started talking to her and working with her and talking about the um, kinds of gameplay that we were wanting to achieve and all those sorts of things, um, she did this one piece of art that uh, almost, I mean, over a year ago, that the game has just now started to finally look like very recently. Nice. Right, this one weird piece of key art, and we all looked at it, and we're just like, "That's it. That's the thing. Like that's the, that's what this game needs to look like." Um, and we did a bunch of experiments after that. We're like, "Well, let's make sure." And we tried a A B C D E thing, and this um, this key piece of art ended up being just very very close to what we wanted to do. Um, and so part of the diorama look is just sort of. Um, comes out of this one piece of art that just accomplished everything we needed to accomplish better than anything else we uh, could figure out. And what we needed to accomplish is a very weird thing of sort of making a board game that's not a board game and trying to get into this weird middle place of, so it's a strategy game, right. it's a tile-based game, right. it's a grid-based game. Right. Uh, you have inventory tokens and things like this. Like, um, if uh, board games could have 
AI helping to manage the thing, we could totally make a physical version of this game. And oh, you wow. You could move little people around and collect inventory and things would happen. And I think you could do that anyway. It would just be, there would be this long phase of moving monsters around using some really weird logic that right. is like... Right. Lots of dice rolls, lots yeah. of like a DM like in the background. Having right, to right. Things. So digital is really good for it, but we didn't want it, we wanted to kind of every every iteration of the visuals and the audio and the presentation and the UI, every iteration of all of those things is trying to get as far from the feeling of a board game where you are kind of in some ways like an omniscient or godlike figure who can grab a piece and move it here and do this and move it here because those feelings are not, um, to us those are in tension with the narrative notion of um, you're alone in the wilderness and you're probably going to die if you're not super careful. Right. So there's a lot of things about the way the camera works in the game and the way that the little dioramas are presented. You know, you don't have, they're not on a 3D tumbler where you can just grab the map and like, you know, like spin around. it around right. and do the thing and like zoom in wherever you want because um, one, it's not necessary for gameplay, but two, it actually feels weird. It feels like the camera is sort of telling you um, these things that uh, that don't fit in with the setting or the story. So there's this kind of constant walking a little bit farther away from board game in all the ways that we can without uh, without sacrificing all of the clarity and all the simplicity that you get from a board game. Right. And it's this tightrope walk that has taken a very long time and has been way more complicated than I expected. Which I, I guess is true of most games. Like, you could say that about Yeah, 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 games, completely. But. I mean, it sounds like you're, you've, you've already put, like, a lot of, like, thought and effort, like, just in the look alone, because of, like, having to, to create this, the diorama. But it, tell, it says everything that you need yeah, in I, there, where it's, you know, you see something in the distance, and you know it's like, I need to investigate this. Or, if, like, if I do investigate this, you're taking a chance. Yes, yeah, I really like um, part of the uh, the board game thing. One thing that I think is great about board games isn't just, I like that they have simple math and simple rules and that you can kind of play them cooperatively. Pandemic is one of our favorite games and they have this great, you know, if one person is really good at Pandemic, that's totally fine. That works in that dynamic because you have this kind of cooperative play experience. And I think that's really cool. And I like that in Pandemic, you can just look at the world map uh -huh. and you can see the state of the game very clearly. You don't really have to go and check and read every single card. If like if this place over here is full of red cubes, right. that's bad. <laughs> and like there's no and this oh this one's full of purple cubes. That's bad. Like you can there's this. Um, uh, uh, Margaret Robertson is one of my favorite sort of game designers and game writers and thinkers. Um, found this term subitizing. What was it again? Subitizing. Subitizing. And subitizing is instant counting. So when you're presented with three, four, five items, like a, like a, usually a number under seven, right. and the way you just sort of go like, oh, there's four of those, three of those. You blah, can blah, just blah. sort of like eyeball it straight off. Yeah, and but it's it's a batch processed thing, not a serial process of going one, two, three, four. Oh. Um, and so I'm really glad I have a word for that now because a lot of Overland's design is based around um, this thing that board games do so well, which is putting all of these subitizing elements. And so there's like, there are no, there are basically no integers greater than three in Overland. Oh, wow. Um, which is gnarly for a strategy game. Normally yeah. you have like stats. This guy has 20 HP. Yeah, this is like 25, this is 17. Yeah. This is going to be hit Because the computer's going to take care of it. Completely. And um, the thing that I think makes that less appealing to me for some games and in some settings is like that XCOM reboot is such an incredible design but if you were to show a screenshot of a player who's about to lose mm -hmm. and a player who's dominating and you show them to somebody who hadn't played XCOM I think they would have a really hard time telling the difference between the two game states sure. um, and so one of the goals with Overland is to be able, if we showed people two screenshots of somebody who has just had a very bad experience at a level, and someone who's really safe and is doing well, they're really uh, easy to read for the most part. Right. This one's full of dead people, and everything's on <laughs> fire. <laughs> and then this one, there's just a couple people shopping. Nice. Right? Like there's a, like there's a really clear, immediate, visual um, distinction, which uh, I'm hoping is going to lead to the kind of thing like the way people play Pandemic, where you have a couple of people talking about what to do next, and then you all kind of move your pieces together. Um, I would, 
I love the idea that Overland can be played that way. Right. That people who maybe aren't gamers could sit down, play a life or death strategy game, do those, help work through those meaningful choices um, because you won't have to teach them stats or really anything. You'd be like, those are, those are bad, those are good. Right. Let's talk about how to min-max this. Uh, and, and finally, I, coming back around it, like meaningful choices. I think that's one of the hardest things that you can sort of do within games, where it's you feel like the things that you're doing actually have an effect like within the world itself. It's not mm -hmm. just like the random die roll that's going to be happening somewhere else. Like how does, how does Overland make those, those choices, those, even those little choices, whether or not we're going to search this, whether or not we're going to go here versus go here, meaningful to the player? Yeah, it's not, um, even as like, as a game designer who's been like really interested in making games with meaningful choices and get like sort of minimalist games where you try to strip out everything except the meaningful choices, a lot, that's where a lot of my background is. And even then, I felt like uh, a lot of our approach to Overland initially was like, oh, meaningful choices. Every click is life or death, um, <laughs> which is like one way of making a meaningful choice, sure. right? Um, and we started with that, and it was really hard to uh, build on that and to kind of like grow that up and grow that out and to be a larger scale experience like if the game takes maybe 30 minutes to play I think you can actually do that pretty mm -hmm. well and maybe we'll do that as a separate project that takes less than three years someday okay but, um, uh, so figuring out how to like uh, flesh it out and grow it out to where you are making um, decisions that uh, so like each click is life or death. Is get it starts to become tricky because that's either only a short-term decision, right? Or it's a short it's a short and a long-term decision. In which case you have dictated the demise of a character right. long right. before it happens. Or very early on, exactly. Yeah, and um, a little bit of that is okay, uh, but the longer those steps are, the more important it is for the player to be able to reverse engineer what happened so they can avoid it next time. And so um, if you look at a game like Spelunky, which has a lot of like life and death choices, Completely. really meaningful choices, right. and lots of consequences for your actions, um, that game, and uh, uh, I would say Rocket League is actually pretty good at this too. Um, hmm. They use replays, but they also have kind of deliberately constructed the game such that um, you know, the longest chain of events, they have this great thing, like I, I really like Spelunky because you'll, you die from an arrow in level four, mm -hmm. and you have this multi-dimensional reverse engineering process where you're like, oh, I shouldn't have jumped then. But if I had three more HP when I jumped, so instead of taking that risky thing two levels before, right. and then maybe if I had saved some ropes, the next time I can do that, like, you get this like, uh, reverse engineering process that in itself isn't as important as uh, your failure produces through that process mm -hmm. a set of heuristics that you can use the next time you play. It gives you a new set of constraints and uh, parameters for your next experiment huh. in this sort of sausage grinding death machine yes, or whatever. A death and machine having indeed. a good idea of what to try next I think is um, uh, on the one hand, I think it's uh, it's important from a playability and replay perspective, but also for me, it's kind of a personal thing about like, um, oh, I failed, uh, that's okay, uh -huh. because uh, you can examine your failures and learn from them, and then you can try again. Um, and that's, like, I think I like games that function this way because that's how you make games. Right, you that's learn a, through failure. Yeah, that's the process of making stuff. Completely. Um, and learning how to cook. And, you know, like learning how to be a good person. Right. Like, like this is a fundamental human process. It's just and something, a very safe way to actually have failures in a yeah. game without actually having the failures in life, having the burnt pot yeah. roast, or just losing your job. And the thing that, um, the thing that I'm so interested in, the reason that I like to make minimalist games, and the reason that a lot of Overland is built like it is, is I feel like a lot of those experiences are kind of corralled behind a hardcore gamers only fence mm -hmm. a lot of the time. Um, and so when we get to see these kind of breakthrough 
minimalist games that actually are pretty gnarly, like Threes, I think, is a great example. Oh, completely. Where you're just like, oh, I'm swiping away. You're like, oh, no, this is actually pretty gnarly. Like, there's real consequences to my decisions. This right. is cool. Uh, Drop Seven is another great example. Mm -hmm. Tetris, obviously. Right. right? Um, these games that take the notion of consequences and failure and learning and experimentation and heuristics, um, but you don't have to learn how to play an RPG or a really hardcore Twitch platformer or a really hardcore strategy. Like They haven't put it behind that wall. That, I think, is the best. Uh, I got to say, I'm really excited to see this game go out into the wild. When, uh, when are you thinking people can get their hands on it? Uh, next year. Next year? Nice. Love That's, it. I'd, I would love to put more detail on it, but I'm not going to yet. But definitely next year. And there may be a way for people that are hearing this or looking at the website and going like, this is the game that I've always needed. Um, we're working on finding a way for people who are really passionate about it and maybe more forgiving about the fact that it's not going to be polished up for a mainstream PC audience yet. Uh -huh. Trying to find a way to make it available to them before the end of the year. Um, but we'll see. Okay, excellent. Well, there you go. Uh, if you're interested in the game, definitely go check out the uh, website, Overland. And uh, thank you very much, Adam, for talking with me Thank today. you, Rob.